Welcome to everyone. And uh, you're joining a webinar, uh, Ban Plutonium Reprocessing in Canada. Uh, my name is Teresa McClenahan. I'm the Executive Director and Counsel with the Canadian Environmental Law Association. I'm also a member of the um, Radioactive Waste Policy Steering Committee, which is um, a group of uh, um, civil society organizations concerned about the development of a, a modern radioactive waste policy for Canada. First thing I'd like to do is uh, to let you know that I'm speaking to you from the Grand River watershed in southwest Ontario. Uh, so this is the historical home of neutral uh, Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee uh, nations. Uh, historically and cu currently continues to be the home of the Six Nations of the Grand River and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And I do want to acknowledge thanks and appreciation uh, to the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit people right across uh, Canada from coast to coast to coast who have lived and stewarded their traditional uh, territories since time immemorial. I acknowledge that we're still seeking justice and reconciliation for many of the decisions and actions that have taken place since settlement, as well as the ongoing failures in many cases to yet achieve meaningful and real justice in relation to many of these lands. So as we continue um, with uh, our webinar this evening, I hope we keep in mind the ongoing need to correct past injustices uh, avoid continuing or creating ongoing or new injustices and seek <laughs> pathways to reconciliation. Um, so I will uh, talk a little bit about why it is that we thought it was so important to invite you to this webinar this evening and then introduce our speakers. Um, so the first uh, thing I'll note you would have um, gathered already from the poster announcing this webinar is that when we're talking about plutonium, it's a byproduct of nuclear reactors. Uh, and then when it's separated from the nuclear fuel after the fuel's been in a reactor, it's a powerful nuclear explosive. Reprocessing uh, refers to doing something with the fuel waste to get uh, plutonium out of it. And it was informally banned in the 1970s in Canada. Um, however, today this has become an extremely urgent issue because the nuclear industry is pushing for plutonium reprocessing and the use of extracted plutonium as a reactor fuel uh, in a new generation of so-called small modular reactors. So we are um, really looking forward to the discussion with our expert speakers on this topic uh, this evening. This is in the context where we have not had a modernized or updated policy on dealing with nuclear fuel waste and other types of radioactive waste in Canada for decades. And Canada did promise to update its radioactive waste policy in the wake of an international review a few years ago. Uh, as a result of that, we have been involved in um, providing comment to the federal government. Um, but within the draft policy that the government released uh, relatively recently, there was a um, statement that reprocessing must adhere to policy. Uh, however, nothing else was said about the topic of reprocessing in that draft pol policy. Uh, we are calling on everyone to become aware of this issue and then in turn to speak up and call on the government to make the policy explicit that reprocessing will be banned. And you'll hear more tonight about why that is so critical to do. So with that, I will uh, introduce our three speakers and then I will call on them in turn uh, to speak to us this evening. So we'll have speaking to us uh, uh, M.V. Ramana, who is the Simons Chair in Disarmament, Global and Human Security, and Professor at the School of Public Policy and 
Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. And Ramana is also a member of the International Panel on Fissile Materials. Then we'll have Ray Atchison, who is Director of Reaching Critical Will, the Disarmament Program of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And they are a member of the steering group of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And finally, we'll have Joshua Frank. We're very pleased that he was able to join us this evening. He's an environmental journalist and editor of Counterpunch and author of the book, the recently released Atomic Days, The Untold Story of the Most Toxic Place in America, published by Haymarket Books in 2022. So with that, can I turn it over to you, Ramana, to start us off for about 15 minutes? Thank you very much, uh, Teresa. I'm going to try sharing my slides. Can you see that? Yes, see we that? can see that. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to speak to you. Um, I'm going to be, I'm talking to you from the traditional <laughs> ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people who have called this area home for thousands of years. I'm privileged to be here. Um, I'm going to focus my talk um, more generally on the three motivations that have been uh, expressed for reprocessing, what the nuclear industry says, uh, and why they would like to do reprocessing, uh, and uh, sort of evaluate uh, these uh, as a way to try and inform the discussion about uh, reprocessing in Canada and elsewhere. So the original motivation for reprocessing was to produce nuclear weapons. And to understand why that's the case, uh, I'll just say very briefly that th there are two materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons, and they tend to be used for different kinds of nuclear weapons. Uh, in the very first uh, weapons that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the first uh, weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima uh, was a uh, built of uh, uranium-235 or highly enriched uranium. Uh, it was um, what is called a gun type weapon. Uh, and uh, it was a rather simple one uh, in terms of the understanding of how that works. In contrast, the second weapon, the one that was dropped on Nagasaki uh, was made of plutonium. And that was a little bit more complicated because it required uh, plutonium to be uh, compressed uh, in a very um, uh, homogeneous fashion in, in the in same way in all directions uh, in order for the plutonium to reach a configuration where it could actually explode and produce the energy that is required to make the bomb go off. And because of uh, this, the uh, plutonium bomb had to be tested. Um, so these are the sort of, uh, broadly speaking, these are the two pathways that can be used. Uh, so one involves the use of highly enriched uranium, the other involves the use of plutonium. And here we are going to be focused primarily on the plutonium route. Uh, the plutonium uh, for the weapon that was dropped on Nagasaki was produced in a reactor that was not uh, it's not very far from where I'm uh, talking from uh, in the in Washington State in the eastern part of Washington State in Hanford, and I'm sure that uh, Joshua will be talking much more about that. And uh, the the what happens in the nuclear reactor essentially is that when the fuel for the nuclear reactor uh, undergoes the fission reactions, uh, it produces lots of neutrons. Some of those neutrons are absorbed by other isotopes of uranium, this was called uranium-238, the heavier isotope, which then uh, through a series of uh, nuclear reactions becomes plutonium. And this plutonium has to be separated from the leftover irradiated fuel. And that's what happens in, in a reprocessing plant. And in the case of the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, that reprocessing also happened in the Hanford uh, site. 
And that was also the first, the very first uh, nuclear explosion in the world uh, was uh, carried out in New Mexico uh, at the Trinity site. And that was a plutonium bomb. The, the reason they had to test it was because there was some concern about whether they knew exactly how plutonium was going to behave. And so plutonium is a little bit more difficult uh, material to uh, deal with. Uh, in the uh, reprocessing plants, uh, what happens is that you don't have to sort of look at all the details. I'll tell you what you want to focus on in that picture on the left side. But essentially what's happening is that the spent fuel is taken. Uh, it's kind of chopped up, dissolved in hot acid, and a bunch of chemicals are added to it to extract out the plutonium and also any uranium that is left over. And uh, the thing that I want you to look at is all the red boxes. These are the multiple streams of uh, radioactive waste that are produced during this process. Uh, that's all I sort of want you to sort of think about, and I'll come back to this later. Um, just historically speaking, once it had been done in uh, in Hanford and other places, uh, you know, other countries also sort of followed suit. And then in the 1950s, uh, as part of Atoms for Peace and all the big uh, meetings that happened in uh, in under the auspices of the United Nations to try and promote uh, atomic energy, uh, including meetings at uh, in Geneva. Uh, the technology for reprocessing uh, was shared with uh, much of the world, and uh, many countries sort of started trying to do uh, reprocessing on their own. A country that's particularly important uh, in this regard was India. Uh, India, as many of you might know, uh, received a, a, re a reactor, uh, what which became called CIRES for Canada India reactor, with the US being tagged on when the United States supplied the heavy water that was used in that. Uh, that reactor is modeled after uh, one of the, N of the NRX reactor in Chalk River uh, near Ottawa. And uh, that was the one that was uh, India first set up in order to be able to um, irradiate, irradiate fuel, which was then extracted at a reprocessing plant uh, at the same site called the Baba Atomic Research Center uh, to produce the plutonium that was first used in 1974 uh, when India first tested a nuclear weapon. Uh, and uh, that uh, test led to a lot of concern about uh, the fact that there was this country which was not expected at that point, uh, at least some people didn't expect it, to uh, develop nuclear weapons. And it had acquired this uh, cap capability to make nuclear weapons by seeking to uh, obtain technology that was ostensibly for peaceful purposes. In fact, India called that a peaceful uh, nuclear explosion using terminology that had become popularized by the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and also uh, Soviet nuclear designers. As a result of that, uh, the US government started uh, looking at reprocessing technology as the technology that allowed uh, India to be able to extract the plutonium. They started clamping down on the spread of reprocessing technology, uh, including, for example, by stopping uh, Pakistan, which was in the process of trying to acquire a nuclear um, reprocessing plant, uh, a pilot one from uh, Belgium, and also was in negotiations with uh, France to obtain a larger one. Uh, and in 1977, uh, the president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, uh, 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 passed a um, decision, made a decision to defer indefinitely the commercial reprocessing uh, of uh, spent fuel and recycling the plutonium in uh, US nuclear power programs. And he was also insistent on having this technology uh, not be exported anymore. Uh, this was kind of uh, reversed a little bit later on when uh, President Reagan came, but that was sort of, it didn't really go anywhere. Uh, the fact is that at this point, after this point, uh, the world in general sort of understood uh, that reprocessing technology was a very critical uh, uh, linkage between nuclear power and nuclear weapons programs. And uh, Canada sort of followed suit in not uh, reprocessing since then. Uh, so, so that is sort of uh, one set of the story. Uh, the, and, and the last thing which I want to say is that 
after the Indian nuclear explosion and all the discussions that happened after that, the nuclear industry typically has taken, uh, will usually make the statement that even though they are doing reprocessing, they have no intention of letting it contribute to proliferation. And so therefore all the technologies they are doing are uh, proliferation resistant. And we'll come back, I'll come back to that later very briefly. Okay, the second motivation uh, for reprocessing comes from a completely different uh, angle. And this has to do with uh, in the expectation uh, starting in the 1950s, uh, going all the way till the 19, uh, early 1980s, that nuclear power was going to grow around the world very rapidly. Uh, so uh, in this, in this uh, picture here, I'm showing some of the projections made by international uh, agencies, such as the International Atomic Energy Agency and the OECD and the US Atomic Energy Agency about what kind of growth can be expected for nuclear power. Uh, and um, none of that uh, turned out to be true, but that's a, uh, that's a separate point. But because of this expectation that there was going to be this rapid growth in uh, nuclear power, uh, everybody was concerned that there was going to be a shortage of uranium available to uh, fuel all these reactors. Uh, the, uh, the estimates of how much uranium was available was uh, much smaller than uh, we know today. Uh, and there was this expectation that because nuclear power is going to grow very rapidly, we, they will, the amount of uranium that will be available to fuel all this is going to run out very quickly. So the solution that had been proposed uh, as early as the 1950s was that the uh, nuclear reactors that would try to exploit the other uh, isotope, the uh, non-fissile isotope, the so-called uranium-238, uh, could be built. These are so-called breeder reactors, and they would be fueled with plutonium that was produced by uh, reprocessing uh, and extracting out plutonium from spent fuel. And uh, this, these reactors could, in principle, produce more plutonium than you put in. Uh, and this happens because the neutrons that are produced in that go on to converting more of the uranium-238 into plutonium. Uh, and uh, these breeder reactors were expected to be the way through which these uh, rapid increases of nuclear power capacity was going to happen. And for this uh, pathway to go forward, it was essential that uh, plutonium reprocessing be carried out. And uh, this is the reason why many countries during that period started setting up reprocessing plants. So if you look at this picture, this is an estimate from the, uh, about eight years ago about what, what were the uh, existing uh, civilian reprocessing plants that are plants that are not intended primarily to make uh, plutonium for nuclear weapons, uh, which were set up primarily by countries because they all thought they were going to go through this breeder reactor route. Um, the uh, you'll see that almost all of those uh, uh, plants were built in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and so on, uh, except for uh, China and uh, Japan. The that uh, expectation about nuclear power's growth did not uh, materialize, and uh, the construction of nuclear power plants essentially. Uh, sort of declined rapidly after the Chernobyl accident in 1986. You will see here a picture of the uh, annual startups of new reactors when reactors start being constructed, uh, connected to the grid, and uh, those re when reactors are being closed uh, because they are either uh, old or they are um, uneconomical. And what you observe is that after the mid uh, 1980s, uh, the number of uh, reactor closures start matching up with the number of reactor startups. And the result is that uh, the, uh, grow, the, the capacity of nuclear power in the world has been more or less constant. However, the ratio of uh, global electricity generated by nuclear power plants has been declining continuously since the mid 1990s. It was about it was about 17.5 uh, percent in the mid 1990s. Uh, it declined to about 10 uh, percent by uh, uh, under 10 percent last year. Uh, and in the during the same period, uh, 
the uh, uh, renewable energy has grown from uh, under 1% to over 12%. So that's a, uh, that's a sort of reflection of the change in uh, the share of nuclear power. And as a result of this, now we know that the world's uranium resources are enough for the foreseeable future, even if you assume optimistic uh, uh, growth of nuclear power in the future. And uh, in, this is sort of the uh, conclusion that the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Nuclear Energy Agency and so on have come out. With, and they've been saying this for over a couple of decades at this point. And you also see that if you look at the cost of uranium, uh, the uranium cost typically goes up whenever there's some kind of expectation that nuclear power is going to expand rapidly. And that happened in the 1970s and then it declined rapidly. And then in the first decade of this century, we saw this increase uh, because of the expectation of something called a nuclear renaissance which uh, then has declined after the Fukushima accident. So uh, the bottom line is that much of this reprocessing uh, was set up uh, during a period when there was this expectation that uh, nuclear power was going to expand rapidly that did not materialize, but many of these reprocessing plants and the people who were investing in them started coming up with a new reason for uh, why they should be doing reprocessing. And that is the idea that reprocessing will help with uh, dealing with nuclear waste. And uh, you know, as you all know, it's been a difficult problem for the nuclear industry to deal with the radioactive waste that they produce. Um, ever since the 19, late 1950s, uh, many countries around the world have uh, assumed that the way to deal with it is to uh, develop some Thing called a geological uh, repository and bury the waste uh, there. Uh, but uh, typically what's happened is that uh, a group of scientists and geologists and engineers will get together and they look around different the, the country and then say, look at different sites and say, here's the site that we, we want to bury the waste. And then they will announce it. And then immediately in all of these places, there is going to be some um, opposition. And uh, the typical pattern has been after that to abandon those sites. And so the uh, my colleague, uh, former colleague Gordon McCarran, uh, came up with the with the acronym DADA for decide, announce, defend, and then abandon. And so this has been a sort of uh, continuing problem for the nuclear industry. And so the idea was that many many of these uh, companies would come in. For example, Moltex in Canada, which will say we have a way by which we can reduce the nuclear waste, uh, and the way they can they hope to do that is to uh, say that we are going to burn some of this waste in our reactor by reprocessing and separating out the plutonium uh, from the uh, other fission products. Uh, the problem is that, as I mentioned. Uh, when you do reprocessing, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, aqueous reprocessing or any other form of reprocessing, uh, it's only a chemical process. And all it can do is to separate out the different kinds of materials inside the spent fuel. The radioactivity doesn't go away because it's not a physical process. There's no way to actually kill the radioactivity as it were. It just gets split into different waste streams. So the, this is the picture here is for the older forms of reprocessing, but that is equally true for the so-called Watts process that Moltex is doing. And so you can sort of look at it in other ways, there are other nice pictures out there, which all basically tell you the same thing. Whether you reprocess or not, you're going to be left with nuclear waste streams to deal with. And uh, these uh, one of the dangers with uh, reprocessing is that when uh, the waste is uh, in the spent fuel, it is in a solid form sitting in some, uh, uh, some uh, site, uh, either uh, under water or in uh, air-cooled uh, buildings, and it's typically going to be staying there. When you reprocess, on the other hand, some of this waste, especially the low level waste, the volume of this is so large that it has to be uh, let out into the biosphere. And we see this in the case of La Hague in France and in, in uh, Sellafield in the UK, the oceans near there have all been contaminated as a result of this. 
Okay, just let me finish with a few sort of counter arguments going back to the original motivation. So to, to uh, the uh, nuclear industry since the 1970s has basically tried to move away from the idea of uh, using reprocessing to make material for nuclear weapons. And so what they typically will say are these some of these arguments. They'll say, well, you can do all this reprocessing, but because we are dealing with so-called reactor glade plutonium, uh, it cannot be used to make nuclear weapons. That's just not true. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy has, uh, which is, has the most experience with nuclear weapons anywhere in the world, has said that virtually any combination of plutonium isotopes can be used to make a nuclear weapon. So that's argument number one. That's uh, not that strikes out. The the second is that uh, reprocessing plants will be safeguarded. The, the International Atomic Energy Agency can take care of this process. There are two problems with that. The first is that. Uh, in almost any of these cases, safeguards cannot ensure that small amounts of material cannot be surreptitiously removed. Uh, this has to do with the fact that reprocessing necessarily sort of is not a what's called a batch process. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it is called a batch process, and it's there are various reasons why it's actually hard to do this. And with some of the newer kinds of reprocessing technologies, the IAA has still not even figured out exactly how they can safeguard uh, these uh, processes. The second problem is that in many of these reactors, because they use plutonium, they are going to be initially fueled before the reactor starts operating with relatively pure kinds of plutonium. So in the case of India, which has had a breeder reactor program, the uh, in initial loading for the, uh, for the reactor would contain enough plutonium for about 125 nuclear weapons. So if a country that has one of these reactors says at some point, look, we have decided we're going to make nuclear weapons, then the IAEA or other country, other agencies cannot really do very much about it. And at best can go into a long standing um, uh, diplomatic uh, imbroglio. The third is of course, uh, the idea that, you know, ours is a different process. It's not the old kind of reprocessing. This is the argument that we have heard repeatedly from companies like Moltex. Uh, the problem there is, or the, the, the uh, issue there is that no matter what the process is, there will still be wasting. So even Moltex will say, oh, we're going to have this higher actinide depleted uranium, uh, noble gas fission products, uh, you know, certain kinds of uh, other fission products that are going to be uh, in the form of some uh, electrolyte that has to be disposed of. And these fission products are actually going to be the cause of most of the radiation dose. I don't expect you to understand what this complicated graph looks like. All I want to point out is that if you look in the long-term future in these repositories, the majority of the dose actually, actually does not come from plutonium or any of the actinides and the lanthanides that are going to be used in the Moltex kind of reactors, but from other fission products. Uh, and there's no way that uh, any of these processes can get rid of those things. So the waste problem is going to remain even in the presence of any of these things. So anyway, uh, let me summarize by saying there were three motivations that I talked about for reprocessing. Two of them really don't meet the reality test. Uh, the third motivation that is to make uh, nuclear weapons still holds. And I will now turn it over to Ray to explain why that's a bad motivation to uh, promote. Thank you. Great, thanks Ramana and uh, Ray. We look forward to your comments for about 15 minutes. Great, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I always learn a lot from listening to Ramana. He's been teaching me for almost two decades now. And I think he's responsible for most of my technical knowledge about nuclear weapons, though not the gaps. Um, and Josh's book is really great. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from him. Uh, but in the meantime, I've been asked to focus on the nuclear weapon element of this puzzle um, rather than reprocessing itself and how lessons from our campaign against nuclear weapons to ban the bomb might be applied in the case of, of reprocessing in Canada and, and elsewhere. Um, so to pick up where Ramana left off about motivations of building nuclear weapons, um, of course, nuclear weapon proliferation is a bad thing. Um, and I'm hoping that folks on this call generally agree with that. Um, but just in case, uh, you know, it's clear to um, those who have experienced nuclear use or testing or production, as well as um, folks working on these issues, that nuclear weapons are not tools of security or 
the maintenance of global peace and security. They're tools of genocide. They are weapons of mass destruction. Their proliferation imperils us all, as does their possession by existing nuclear armed states. And so I think this was made extremely clear last year from the threats made by the Russian government to use nuclear weapons in the context of its war in Ukraine. Um, but also, this is not the first time that we've seen these kinds of threats. Um, North Korea and the United States were quite explicit a few years ago. Um, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. We have countless um, invisible and somewhat visible um, moments throughout history in which nuclear weapons have almost been used and detonated, um, and also accidents um, or, or uh, near use. Um, and we can see that uh, the theories around nuclear weapons that that speak to their value as these tools of security are indeed theories. So the theory of nuclear deterrence, the theory of geostrategic stability. These theories persist um, largely because certain people profit from it, certain organizations profit from it, certain governments profit from it. People have built careers around these theories. Um, about 45 to $50 billion a year in the United States goes to nuclear weapons. About $82.5 billion was spent on nuclear weapons in 2021 globally from the, the nine nuclear armed states. Based on the rough calculations, not everybody is super transparent about what they're spending on their nuclear arsenals, but that's what activists and, and think tanks and others have been able to piece together. And I think when we're when we're talking about money, when we're thinking about the, the sort of nuclear industrial complex in all of its manifestations, the theorizing around nuclear weapons are, are part of that. And you know, we can think about what uh, what the anti-nuclear movement would look like if these funds were at our disposal and how that might affect the dominant narrative. Um, a study recently by Shulv Igeland and Benoit Plapidis show that funding is actually withheld from anti-nuclear activists, from abolitionists, and given deliberately instead to those who are committed to upholding the status quo and the dominant narrative. Um, and so in this sense, think tanks, academics, government institutions, they're all part of the nuclear complex and they're paid to promote deterrence theory or the step-by-step -step approach to arms control. And I'll pop the link to, to some of the things I'm referencing in the chat once I'm done speaking, I can't multitask very well. Um, so the, the problem of all this is that these theories, the bottom line support proliferation, right? Because if the narrative, if the, if the dominant argument around nuclear weapons for, for the states that have them is that they're necessary for security, that they're the ultimate guarantor of the sovereignty of the nation state or however they're presented, then of course, why wouldn't other governments perceive that perceived threat to their stability or to their existence seek nuclear weapons. So this is a situation that we absolutely do not want. Um, and so in it's within this environment and context that the work to abolish nuclear weapons has happened. And when we organized to ban the bomb through a treaty at the United Nations, we did take as our starting point that the dominant narratives about nuclear weapons were incorrect and also immoral. And so instead of getting caught up in a lot of these theoretical debates about deterrence, we refocused the conversation on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. We examined and amplified what nuclear weapons do to human bodies, to animals, to the land, to water, to infrastructure. And this is something that, that Josh really brings out in his book very clearly and that other studies have done as well around the sites um, that have produced nuclear weapons as well as sites where they've been tested and used. Um, we relied on a lot of research and new generative research published by doctors and humanitarian agencies, uh, the International Red Cross, um, and sort of held up these resources as the truth about nuclear weapons. And we also worked very closely with survivors of nuclear testing and use and impacted communities or affected communities. And so in addition to um, relying on testimony and their lived experience to inform um, this sort of truth telling about nuclear weapons, we also learned from strategies 
that they have used more locally in opposition to nuclear weapons, whether that has been against nuclear waste or nuclear testing um, or for compensation for, for harms that have been caused, et cetera, and tried to form and are still forming, it's a work in progress, um, real partnerships between traditional owners of the land and activists and academics. Um, and part of this is challenging also what nuclear armed governments have said about their own nuclear weapon testing histories and production histories, because a lot of that is is um, is secret uh, or untransparent or glossed over. We also deliberately, many of us, not everyone involved, but many of us also took a feminist and or a queer approach to the issue of nuclear weapons. We focused on human security rather than state security. We recognized and talked about openly the gendered norms behind nuclear weapon possessions, behind identity and power and strength and the ways that uh, gender feeds into our, our conceptions about gender feed into um, our ideas about what nuclear weapons are for and who they serve. And we exposed a lot of patriarchal techniques or, or discourse or language that are used around nuclear weapons and that are used to paint abolitionists as naive or irrational um, or emotional as we were often cause, called for talking about the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. And we built up a community of actors across a range of, of disciplines and organizations. Um, we built up a community of trust with diplomats, um, with survivors, with academics, and we worked together to build a sense of possibility alongside the knowledge building and the commitment building um, that we did with, with these very different types of people coming at this issue from very different platforms. And so all of this work um, didn't just achieve new international law, it did with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons adopted in 2017, but it also changed the way that nuclear weapons are being discussed even outside of this treaty. Um, and so it's increased credibility and space for alternative perspectives and voices. So now this is something other forums on nuclear weapons, even those that are still resistant to the Prohibition Treaty are having to grapple with internally. Um, it's led to divestment from nuclear weapon producing companies, um, divestment both from individual people, you know, calling their banks, um, cities divesting uh, city pension funds, uh, all kinds of economic implications for the nuclear uh, weapon industry. Um, and also we've had some impacts around public opinion and government positions, even in the allies of nuclear armed states and to some extent, even the nuclear armed states themselves. And so this last point brings me to where is Canada in all of this? Um, the Trudeau government has consistently opposed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It did not participate in negotiations of the treaty. It's refused to sign or ratify the treaty it uh, did not join the first meeting of states parties, which took place in June last year, even though several other NATO governments did participate. And so it claims that it opposes the treaty because um, of its membership in NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, and this is uh, the argument that many uh, NATO countries use that they they need to have a consistent internal policy on nuclear weapons and NATO is self described as a nuclear alliance, but that description and that understanding of itself is actually fairly recent and there's an excellent article that I'll also pop in the chat um, by Shulv England who um, goes through the history of NATO discourse and policy on nuclear weapons and sort of debunks this myth and shows that it was really the United States as well as the UK and France to some extent that forced NATO into becoming a nuclear alliance in order to share the burden um, of, of their support for nuclear weapons. Um, but regardless of, of that history, the US, or Canada of course is, um, is still not supporting the treaty. And this is part of the current Liberal Party's philosophy around militarism more broadly, in, in my opinion. Um, you know, we can see that the government is increasing the military budget. 
um, buying this exorbitant new fighter jet, um, is making profits from selling weapons to Saudi Arabia at the same time that it claims to have a feminist foreign policy. So there's all these problems in terms of militarism and weapons and, and conflict that um, Canadians, Can the Canadian government's stated intentions in terms of foreign policy do not actually match up to the reality of the budgets and um, and how they're operating in the in the world. And so I think that the the stated desire for this feminist foreign policy, the the um, Trudeau government's um, uh, interest, self interest in being you know seen uh, globally as liberal and progressive. Um, is really a point that as activists against reprocessing, against nuclear weapons, against nuclear waste, whatever it is that we're working on, we really need to exploit this because there is an inherent contradiction there. Um, and I think that we have uh, many ins to this particular government um, on that image level that we should be exploiting. Um, and I think in the broader Canadian public sense, um, you know, for... It's not necessarily um, a universal uh, reckoning that's happening right now, but I do see a lot of people being challenged by um, what for many are, are revelations about uh, the Canadian settler state's relationship with First Nations throughout history and in uh, current times. And I think helping people to reckon with um, the, the nuclear aspects of that settler colonial relationship in terms of nuclear waste, in terms of uh, uranium mining, and now in terms of reprocessing as well, is extremely important because so much of this has happened and will happen on First Nations land. And so this is another aspect that I think for the Canadian public is, um, is something that we can um, really work with in order to educate around these issues and help engage people uh, in, in anti-nuclear activism. So I'm gonna stop there and looking forward to hearing more about Hanford from Josh. Super, thank you, Ray and uh, Josh. We're equally interested in your comments uh, as well for the next 15 minutes before we start to look at the um, questions people have been posing and, and have some follow-up discussion. Great. Hey, uh, thanks uh, for everybody coming this evening and logging in and for the two speakers. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and unfortunately, talking about a very um, sad situation. Um, I recently wrote a book called Atomic Days, which dives into the history and current conflict that's happening in Eastern Washington State. Um, Hanford was one of the first uh, three sites chosen by the United States during the Manhattan Project, uh, along with Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Los Alamos. Hanford is located in Eastern Washington State along the Columbia River. Uh, it was chosen uh, as a site for the, this um, early scientific research and development um, because of its remoteness. Um, there were really just peasant farmers and um, Native uh, Americans that were on the land, so they were deemed expendable. It uh, was sort of out of sight, out of mind. It was along the Columbia River as well, and the Columbia River provided clean access to water um, and constant access to electricity because of uh, dams that were downstream. Um, and the, the site was really run as a covert military operation and produced uh, plutonium for atomic weapons for nearly four decades. Um, the Hanford site itself is uh, 586 square miles and arguably the most contaminated place uh, on Earth, um, definitely in the United States and the Western Hemisphere. Uh, there's really no match. Hanford's B reactor uh, was first operable in 1944 and produced plutonium. Um, and it was, uh, you know, at the time, uh, obviously a covert military operation, um, the, the fuel of which it produced for, for the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. It's now a historic uh, landmark, tens of thousands of tourists go there every year. Um, I had the misfortune of going there about 10 years ago and I went on the tour and I can tell you that um, there's very little mention about what our bombs have done 
to the Japanese or what Hanford has become since that time. And uh, instead it's, it's full of American prowess um, that's uh, touting the scientific and engineering ingenuity that went into this and the great men that built this thing. Um, but really um, it's a testament uh, to the opposite, which is that um, it's, a, it's an icon of war and it continues to be. It's really a very bizarre ride through the bowels of US imperialism. This is really the, um, <laughs> it may be unflattering to look at pictures of these big tanks sitting in dirt, um, but this is really the biggest problem that's posed right now for Hanford. And this is what we're dealing with today. Um, the, the legacy of the Cold War is still bubbling there. It's now the most toxic site, as I mentioned, in the Western Hemisphere. And it's really an environmental crime scene. Uh, the site that they stopped producing plutonium at the end of the 1980s as the Cold War uh, wine uh, was coming to an end. And it quickly became, instead of producing plutonium and all of this fuel, became the most expensive uh, environmental cleanup in world history. And it's now the largest environmental cleanup ever with a price tag of about $677 billion. That's a billion with a B. And just to put that in perspective, um, the space station is something like $126 billion. Um, and just four years ago, uh, the price for this cleanup was, was billed at about $400 billion. So it's uh, almost an exponential price tag that this cleanup has. And it's, there's no doubt that one day it will um, overtake $1 trillion. There's just no question that it's going in that direction. Uh, the US Department of Energy is tasked with overseeing the cleanup process. Um, the process is largely undertaken by private companies like Bechtel, who you may have heard of. Um, Bechtel has a very shoddy track record and has been reaping the spoils of US imperial ventures all over the globe. Um, today, there are 56 million gallons of highly radioactive waste sitting in 177 of these big, gigantic underground tanks. Um, the tanks themselves were really only supposed to last. Uh, two to three decades. We're now going on 80 years. Um, it's really um, a dire situation. Uh, some of these tanks sit um, right above groundwater supplies that feed the Columbia River. Uh, these tanks, some of them are only seven miles away from the Columbia River. Um, and it's the Columbia River, as many of you probably know, is the lifeblood of uh, thousands of farmers in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's also uh, uh, home to dozens of commercial fisheries. Um, over the course of uh, the operation years of Hanford, the government has admitted to 67 tanks um, having leaked. There's likely been many more leaks than that, that we just don't know about. Um, and uh, as mentioned, a lot of this radioactive uh, waste has made its way into the soil and into the groundwater supplies. Um, we know of uh, some of the tests that uh, were conducted during its operation that there were um, radioactive fish being found at the mouth of the Columbia River. Uh, there's just no doubt that the Columbia River itself is radioactive. Um, aside from all of the waste that's sitting inside of these tanks, there were billions of gallons of chemical and radioactive waste that was literally dumped directly into the soil um, at the time. And that it creates uh, obviously a huge problem as well that that um, some of these trenches were not even lined and that waste has um, completely polluted the groundwater supplies uh, in certain areas of the site. Uh, as I mentioned, the largest task is cleaning up all of this waste that's sitting in these tanks. Um, and they plan to turn this stuff into a form of glass through a process called vitrification. And um, at, at the onset of the cleanup, uh, a lot of the, the DOE and its contractors promised that this vitrification process would be really easy to do, almost like making ice and, you know, putting water in an ice tray and putting it in the freezer and forgetting about it. But um, that has not been the case. Uh, you know, the idea was to vitrify this stuff and then store it permanently and safely. But it's proved um, enormously difficult and very, very expensive. Uh, the budget um, just for this uh, plant called the waste treatment plant where the vit vitrification is to take place has already run $60 billion. 
it's going to cost a lot more. Um, and there's been a lot of false promises along the way. Uh, even last fall, they had a uh, test facility up and running to vitrify low level waste. And they were very excited about it. They did a little, almost a, almost a ribbon cutting and uh, they heated the thing up and it uh, in one day overheated and they had to shut it down and go back to the drawing board. Uh, meanwhile, the you know, US taxpayers are footing the bill for this cleanup and there's very, very little oversight. Um, there's very little transparency in this cleanup. And uh, the Department of Energy, as many whistleblowers have told me, uh, is just not equipped to deal with the enormity of the problem. Um, it's uh, one of the most um, scientifically difficult uh, of uh, endeavors that the Department of Energy deals with. And the government um, doesn't really let the public in on this. And the public is very unaware of the dangers that, that continue to persist at the site. Um, and right now there are two tanks that are leaking that we know about, and they just aren't uh, doing anything about it because they don't have anywhere to put the waste. Um, it just has nowhere to go. They don't know what to do. They have put tarps over the tanks, hoping that rainfall will not uh, push that radioactive effluent closer to the groundwater supplies. Um, it's a pretty dire situation. Um, I interview an uh, ex-DOE scientist who's now retired named Donald Alexander. And he is very, very, very concerned about what's going on at Hanford. He worked there for decades. Uh, one of the, the you know, worst case scenarios is an explosion in one of these tanks. Um, the tanks, each one of them has slightly different uh, makeup. Some of them have, some of them, they don't even really know what's in these tanks because there were so many chemicals that were um, put in them over the course of its life. And uh, there's constant hydrogen buildup in a few of these tanks that they have to monitor. Um, if, uh, if there's a, a lot of hydrogen that builds up and if somehow a spark is ignited, you could see a, a catastrophic explosion. He's very, very worried about that. He's worried about an explosion or a hydrogen buildup in uh, the waste treatment plant itself, uh, which isn't up and operating yet. Um, it's uh, the explosion, a worst case scenario could completely decimate the Pacific Northwest. It could co contaminate the Columbia River even more. It could lay waste to the surrounding um, community of Richland and Asco and Kennewick, which are the Tri-City area there. Uh, Walla Walla, Washington is not far away. There would be uh, radioactive waste, or I'm sorry, uh, airborne particulates that would go all over Montana, you know, parts of Canada, of course. Uh, places like Boise, Idaho would most likely be uninhabitable. People wouldn't wanna raise their families in places that boasted of high, radio, high radioactivity. Um, you know, of course, this is a very, you know, a remote possibility, but it's a possibility nonetheless because of, uh, and the longer this waste sits there, the longer um, and the more potential for a, cat a, cat a catastrophic event. And this is not without, this is not just, you know, alarmism. Uh, there was a similar accident at a sister facility called Mayak in Russia in 1957. It wasn't a hydrogen buildup. Um, it was a sodium caused fire in one of their waste tanks that completely decimated an entire region. Um, it's, it's one of the, the least known uh, uh, nuclear accidents to have happened, um, largely because it was a covert military operation there. Um, it took a few years for the, even the US CIA to find out about it. And it wasn't until the 80s that they came clean about what they knew and, and the, the, the catastrophe that had happened. Um, Donald Alexander, who I just mentioned that worked for the Department of Energy went over there in the 90s to uh, share research with some of the scientists there about uh, that had been working on the cleanup there. And he came back very concerned that a similar accident could happen in Hanford. Um, so I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a very scary situation. Um, this is a little photograph of Hanford's Purex facility, which is where they reprocessed waste and, and uh, um, refined plutonium. It was a huge operation and, and remains on the site today as one of the most contaminated areas in the site. Most of this waste that you see in those tanks, a lot of it came from the reactors at, at Hanford. There were nine reactors, but a lot of it also came from the Purex facility. And then there's really no way of knowing uh, what came from what. It was all literally being dumped um, in all of these places uh, at a pace that's really hard to fathom. 
um, you know, the, the fear of the Soviets uh, outweighed any potential concern for environmental catastrophe or to, you know, to the community or to the workers themselves that were at the site. Um, and I think it's really important to juxtapose these, what Hanford is today with what it used to be. Um, this is Celilo Falls. Uh, Celilo Falls was a fishery for natives uh, for thousands of years in the area. The Wanapin, the Yakima, the Nez Pierce. It also was a trading um, post for tribes up and down the West Coast from Vancouver all the way down to Southern California. It, it was a spiritual site as well, as you can imagine. Um, this site later was flooded because of a dam that was built, and it's just downstream from Hanford. Uh, so a lot of the victims of Hanford were also victim to the colonization of their lands um, in many forms over the years. And I, I guess I'd like to end, you know, we can talk about the horrors of, of uh, proliferation, of waste, um, but I think it's also important to uh, lift ourselves up and, and know that progress can be made, despite how against the odds it may seem. Um, one of the inspirations for me, um, and I, I got to know him over the years, uh, his name was Russell Jim, he passed away a few years ago. He was a Yakima elder who for decades uh, really learned the intricacies of what was going on at Hanford. Um, his, his tribe uh, was direct, directly impacted by the Hanford operation. They were physically and forcibly removed from the land um, and they uh, experienced a lot of the damaging effects of the project itself. Uh, over the years, there were intentional and accidental releases of radioactive materials like iodine-131 and other materials that uh, impacted water supplies, impacted the air quality. Um, he, his, uh, he personally knew many people who had thyroid cancers, um, rheumatoid arthritis, and other things. And he, he made it his life's uh, work to fight against the, the government um, and to hold them accountable and give a voice to his people. And he, he really did that. Uh, in, the, in the 90s, when Hanford was being considered as a uh, repository for nuclear waste, uh, he said, enough's enough. This land is already as polluted as it needs to be and we need to be cleaning it up and not adding more damage. Uh, he went out to, to Congress, spoke to Congress, and um, he, he was victorious and his, and his people were victorious and he's almost single-handedly um, forced the federal government to recognize the rights of the Yakima Nation. And to this day, no major decisions um, at the Hanford site can be made without a seat at the table for the Yakima people. Uh, really remarkable man and an inspiration, I think, to all of us when we are um, looking at some of these daunting tasks ahead of us. Um, and, and of course, he's not alone. There are many others. There's a group up in Seattle called Hanford Challenge that is representing whistleblowers. Uh, there are uh, a group called Columbia Riverkeeper, which is working on a lot of the environmental impacts. Um, and then, you know, there are as I mentioned, you know, this being the, the most expensive environmental cleanup in world history, there are thousands of workers on the site. Um, and there are unions there that are not really doing their job, I would argue. Um, this is one of the most toxic sites and uh, most perilous jobs imaginable. There's lots of whistleblowers that have come forward um, that they are working in horrid, con horrible conditions. And uh, they need a voice as well. And if, if Hanford, is to one day, you know, be safe. Um, it's going to take the tenacity of a lot of activists to do that. Um, and I, I guess I'd like to juxtapose that as well with uh, with this idea of reprocessing waste, um, or the idea that nuclear power is an answer to climate change, which we can we can get into in the Q and A a little bit, um, because the legacy of of waste that's radioactive, um, it it lasts a millennia. It, it, it outlives all of us. It's uh, generations down the road and, and the, the decisions we make now is gonna impact them. And I just hope that uh, we all take that into consideration. I mean, we, we, we talk about climate change, we're worried about what climate change is doing and what it will do, 
And I, I would argue um, we should be equally as concerned about the other decisions that we make when it comes to answers to that problem. Um, so with that, thank you. And uh, I guess it's Q&A. Super, thank you, Joshua and Ray and Ramana for uh, very, very enlightening, uh, thoughtful um, and thought provoking um, presentations for all of us. Uh, so I have not, I, because I'm also keeping some notes for a summary at the end, um, have not been monitoring the Q&A in the chat, which is why we have uh, Susan as the chat master and Brene as the um, Q&A master. Um, so I'm going to call on them to pull out some of the questions and I will help uh, direct them, but also invite the speakers to um, jump in or wave at me if you have um, something to add with, uh, with those. Um, but let me start with one that I think I caught out of the corner of my eye at a very general level um, while uh, Brene and Susan review those, uh, those uh, pieces, um, which is if each of you can just take a, a minute or so on the relevance of your presentation and your area of expertise to this question of the Canadian policy on radioactive waste and the lack of any explicit ban on reprocessing plutonium. So maybe we'll go backwards in order and Joshua, you can talk about that first because you started on it just at the very end about, um, uh, you know, is nuclear the answer to climate change? Um, and uh, uh, what about the nuclear waste? And and uh, I also caught out of the corner of my, of my eye a point people saying, well, the volumes are not very big, which is something we hear often. But Ramana, you talked about the fact that actually the volumes can get to be quite big. So you can weigh in on that in a second. But anyway, first first to you, Joshua. Uh, ban um, on reprocessing, is that is that relevant for, for a modern Canadian radioactive policy? I don't think uh, nuclear technology uh, for weapons or power alone is viable for, for many reasons. Um, and my own research with the Hanford project, um, clearly uh, it's an extreme example of um, a military installation gone wild for decades. Um, but I would caution anybody that believes that any of our governments are rational actors today uh, that we can trust them to do what's right, even if all of the, um, <laughs> if everything that's true with the boosters say about reprocessing or atomic energy or, or weapons, uh, even if all of that is true, no one can, can promise us that 10 years from now or 20 years from now, 60 years from now, 1,000 years from now, that we're going to have rational, rational actors uh, managing this stuff. Um, it's, it's not a, just an immediate problem, but a problem that lasts thousands of years. So I, I think that we need to be realistic about that. Um, and I think we need to look at um, history to, um, you know, for, for answers to that question, because um, what, what Western government has acted rationally in the last, you know, <laughs> since their inception militarily? Um, I don't. I don't see how anybody can believe any of the rhetoric coming out of a government or uh, a pro nuke industry. Um, thank you for that, Joshua and Ray. What's your thought on that um, big question in terms of your area of expertise, which is the seeking of an international ban on nuclear weapons, and this prospect of um, Canada um, entering into the world of reprocessing if some of the proposals were to ever proceed? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I agree with what Josh just said um, that, and I would, I, I don't know if he explicitly said this, but then the follow on would be, I think the nuclear industry should, should you know, or the aspects of the nuclear industry from reprocessing or weapons or, what not should all be prohibited. I don't think Canada as a government, um, as a country should be um, involved in nuclear technology, particularly not as a solution uh, to climate change. And, you know, in this in this moment of time of, of climate crisis and chaos, the nuclear industry is using this as an opportunity to sort of sell itself as as a viable solution um, 
carbon free um, solution. And it's just, first of all, that's just false, um, a false premise. But also, it's such a toxic industry um, that instead, Canada, if it actually, if it actually is serious about having uh, good relations, healing relations with First Nations, if it's actually serious about being a climate leader, if it's actually serious about being feminist, then it needs to be investing in renewable energies, um, degrowth as well, in terms of using less energy, um, and those types of approaches to the climate crisis, not investing in, in more into uh, toxic industries that risk proliferation of nuclear weapons. Thank you for that as well. And and Ramana, what are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, um, so there's lots to be said. Let me actually focus a little bit on some of the ch chat about the relevance of this to uh, Canada. Uh, so, you know, one thing we do know is that Canada does not have an official ban. I said Canada stopped in the 1970s trying to do that. Um, but you know, now with uh, Moltex and uh, you know possibly Arc and other companies, there is this opening now to separate out plutonium. Uh, a lot of the discussion from the, the nuclear industry and its supporters is this is not all reprocessing. Uh, we are going to just burn the uh, so-called transuranics in the in the uh, reactor, and so that's actually going to help with the uh, nuclear waste problem. Uh, there are sort of two things. One of them I talked about during the talk, during the uh, slide presentation, was the fact that the dominant radiation dose comes from what are called fission products. Fission products are those which are produced by the action of fission when the uranium nucleus or the plutonium nucleus splits to produce lighter uh, elements. Uh, and they are also radioactive. And uh, those are not transuranics. Those don't get burnt in the nuclear reactor. So there has to be, and if that is, many of them are very long lived, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, some of them. And so there is no way that you can avoid the necessity for, of a geological repository for waste from reprocessing as well. So in that sense, reprocessing does not get rid of the problem of nuclear waste. The second issue is that um, any process uh, when you're doing reprocessing is never going to be 100% efficient, uh, whether you're pyroprocessing, whether you're doing other ways of reprocessing, you're never going to be 100% efficient in removing all the plutonium from the spent fuel into the fuel for the new reactor. Some of that is going to be left behind in the material that's in the waste, in the, in the salts, in the case of pyroprocessing. And that again will have to be managed for the period of time that plutonium is going to be radioactive, which is you know 25, I mean, it's so hundreds of thousands of years that also has to be managed again. So uh, the bottom line is that even these newer forms of reprocessing don't mm -hmm. avoid the waste problem. And in a way, for me, what uh, Josh was talking about was the challenges of dealing with waste that is produced using new forms of technology that have not been done before. This was the case during the time of the Manhattan Project. At that time, nobody knew how to deal with all of this. They went ahead and produced all this waste, assuming that somehow this is going to get solved in the future. And we are now more than 70 years past that time. And we still don't have a solution to deal with all of those things. The, you know, all the problems that George sort of uh, described are going on at this point. There is absolutely no guarantee that all of these so-called new forms of reprocessing that are going to be done will not lead to such long-term problems. In fact, I would guess that they will lead to problems that people will be saying, oh my God, we didn't have any idea about how to, that this would happen when we actually try to deal with that. So I think what he said is absolutely relevant. History is relevant. It's a very uh, unfortunate thing, I think, in the, especially in the nuclear industry, that somehow they assume that all of the problems with nuclear power and associated technologies are things uh, of the past, and somehow the future is going to be perfect. Everything is going to work out perfectly in the future uh, without sort of realizing that they're going to be coming up with newer problems that we don't have solutions to. Thank you. 
Uh, okay, thank you for that. So, um, Brinane, you're monitoring the Q and A. Is there a question you want to pull out um, from the questions that have been posed over the course of the evening? Sure, thanks, Teresa. We've got lots of excellent questions. Uh, I think I'll just start with the first one that came in, and I think it's a question for Ramana, but I'll leave you to direct that, Teresa. Uh, the question is from Martin. In Canada, can you compare the total life cycle costs of new can-do versus new SMR reactors versus new renewable energy of any sort? Uh, I can take a crack at it. I mean, I think, I don't know what exactly uh, the questioner means by life cycle cost. Uh, the, the metric that's often used to calculate uh, the cost of electricity from a nuclear reactor is something called the levelized cost of uh, energy, uh, LCOE. And I've done calculations, others have done calculations that show that sometimes the cost of uh, electricity from uh, um, small modular reactors can be up to 10 times as high as that of uh, renewables. Uh, you know, the in the United States, there are costs that uh, the, a company called Lazard comes up with every year for the levelized cost of energy from uh, the nuclear power plants that are being built in the United States. These are large nuclear plants, uh, and those are typically something of the order of $150, $160 per megawatt hour, whereas new wind and solar are coming around uh, around $30 to $40 per megawatt hour. So it's about four to five times as high. The last thing I would say is that everything we know about small modular reactors suggests that they are going to be more expensive per unit of electricity generated simply because they don't have economies of scale. And we are seeing these loss of economies of scale in the case of the most uh, advanced uh, small modular reactor project in the United States, a so-called new scale project, which at this point is about 250% uh, more expensive per unit of uh, electricity generation capacity than the Vogel plant uh, in Georgia was before construction started. So there's almost no way that new scale can be more, can be produce cheaper electricity than a large nuclear reactor, which itself is producing electricity at about four or five times as much as the, that of renewables. Um, okay, thank you. Brennan, do you have another question you want to pull out? I have many more questions. Uh, a question from Connie. Uh, Connie's asking if there are any proposed uh, advanced, quote, uh, advanced reactors uh, that are going to be capable of reprocessing uh, presumably irradiated fuel waste and or breeding plus producing electric power. I think this is probably another question for Ramana. Um, so some of these nuclear reactors that have been proposed, small modular reactors, do require reprocessing of spent fuel prior to actually operating the reactor, because that's how you produce the fuel to be able to load the reactor in the first place. So the answer is yes. I'll sort of, there's lots of other questions, so I'm not going to elaborate on that. Okay, another one, Brene, and then I'm going to pose one that... Um... I'm kind of gleaning from some of the discussion that I think it's super important to straighten out as well. Great. Uh, so a question, and I'm going to paraphrase it. It's a, it's a little long from Rob. Uh, and Rob's talking about solar and wind have already won the race. There's large batteries now available for back at power. Um, we have solar uh, as, a, as, a, as a good source. Uh, nuclear is the most expensive choice. Why are politicians so attracted to it? Uh, solar and wind are easier, cheaper, faster to deploy quickly. Uh, isn't the speed of making the switch in an emergency, a climate emergency, the most important thing to consider? I think I'm going to direct that one to Ray because, Ray, it sounds like in some of the work you were doing, you were getting at um, these underlying questions about why, uh, why the governments continue to go down this road and what's persuading them, what's the decision-making framework that's allowing that to happen. Yeah, sure, I can I can take a, a stab at it, but definitely if Ramana and Josh have things to add, feel free. Um, I think the short answer is industry lobbying, right? And the profits that can be made from the nuclear industry um, uh, 
tend to be greater, particularly at this point in time, even though it is vastly more expensive for taxpayers. Um, and so just as with nuclear weapons, there are economically, political, economic vested interests in, in the project of, of nuclearism. Um, and I think, I can't remember the acronym that you mentioned, Ramana Data, that really spoke mm -hmm. to me because we see that all the time, whether it's, you know, whether it's nuclear power, nuclear waste projects. And um, I track this a lot with with our Australian, ICANN Australia colleagues as well. And it's it's always that same cycle and it ends in abandon um, at the end. So I think that 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 is another sort of piece of of um, how these things cycle. But in the meantime, of course, um, we should be switching to to renewables and focusing on degrowth instead of this industry. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add since you know we're fusion has been making some headlines <laughs> recently. Um, just to preface, I mean, it's, I think it's a perfect example of what Ray is talking about. Um, in the case of fusion, the U.S. government has been pouring literally billions of dollars into this research under the guise recently, especially under the Biden administration, that it's going to be a you know, uh, answer to climate change. But as anybody really that knows what they're talking about, and <laughs> Ravana can, they can elaborate on this, he wrote a great piece on it, um, that it's not going to, first of all, it's not going to happen in time commercially to produce electricity. And really, it's all about uh, increasing the United States atomic weapons program, uh, testing and development. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, hoodwinking going on behind closed doors when it comes to this type of uh, funding for technology. And Ramana, did you have anything to add on that one? No, I think we have lots of other questions. Let's move on. All right. Well, let me let me ask this one. Um, could you, and I think this probably is for you, Ramana, could you talk about this issue about whether you need the plutonium to be a specific grade of plutonium to be usable in, in weapons? versus quote reactor grade um, because I saw I saw that discussed in the 2015 report on the international panel on fissile materials and I think it's important for the attendees here to understand the the issue there and the fact that it's still a risk if it's quote reactor grade yeah, yeah that's a great question so there are two aspects which I think one needs to sort of separate out one is the question of what kind of plutonium, reactor-grade plutonium or weapons-grade plutonium. Um, reactor-grade plutonium has been, you know, the, I, I showed a slide where I uh, gave the references to the U.S. Department of Energy saying that re any uh, any isotopic uh, uh, mixture of uh, plutonium can be used in nuclear weapons. That in other words, reactor-grade plutonium can be used. The second issue that sort of is confusing is uh, the question of plutonium mixed with other substances. Uh, so I'll say one a couple of things about that. One is that uh, in spent fuel, uh, in the fuel that is irradiated in nuclear reactors, either CANDU reactors or light water reactors, the plutonium is intimately mixed with all of these fission products, which I talked about earlier, which are very radioactive. So it becomes impossible to actually deal with that plut the plutonium without getting a lethal radiation dose for a person, or in the case of trying to put it inside a nuclear weapon, the weapon itself becomes highly radioactive and so cannot really be handled by crew in a way. And so you have to separate out the uh, uh, fission products. If the plutonium, you, you, what some of the more modern forms of uh, reprocessing are trying to do is to say, we don't separate out the some of the non-plutonium uh, uh, products that are going to be in that, the, especially the so-called transuranics. And that, in a way, is going to make it uh, difficult to use in a nuclear weapon. The answer is that um, that is technically true. You have to do some further processing of this material uh, because you don't want to have in your bomb all of these other higher uh, transuranics. What you do, want, what you are doing, though, is that you are doing the bulk of the work for the country or the team that wants to make this impure plutonium into plutonium because you've already removed the radiation barrier for the by the most part so it is there is some processing that has to be done before making a nuclear weapon but it's orders of magnitude easier to do that and one should remember that even in the best of circumstances even if you're going to sort of give them weapon grade plutonium 
the host country will have to do some amount of metallurgy and other work to make nuclear weapons. So you're talking about countries and entities that have technical capacity to do these kinds of things. So all you're doing is you're giving them uh, on a platter what they would have to do much, much more work in order to extract otherwise. And more important, that the, the latter kind of work is more easily uh, um, identifiable from remote sources. So you know when a country is building a big reprocessing plant, but you may not know when they are setting up a small hot cell to be able to separate out plutonium from impure plutonium. Okay, thank you for that. Um, back to you, Brinane, and then Susan, I'll call on you about whether there's something particular you wanna pick up from the chat or whether you've directed them to the Q&A. But uh, Brinane, the next question you'd like to uh, bring up. Great, thanks, Teresa. Uh, it's a question from all, and I think it's for Joshua. Uh, the US is struggling to deal with plutonium production waste, uh, such as at the tanks at Hanford. Are other plutonium countries, such as France or the UK, having any better success? Um, <laughs> well, none of them compare in the quantity that has been developed in the US over the course of the Cold War. Um, and with that said, uh, I believe that they have, you know, they're managing it in a slightly better way. However, you know, this waste still is virulent. It's still radioactive and it's still a problem. Um, they probably weren't dumping in, you know, chemicals into the soil, <laughs> but, you know, by the, by the millions. Um, but these, it still poses a problem and it's still, um, an answer that the, the, you know, nuclear industry doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Susan, is there something you wanted to pull out from the chat um, that we should ask the presenters to comment on before we go back to the question list? Well, I think uh, given the time, Teresa, thanks for the opportunity. I just would like to remind everyone to keep checking the reprocessing.ca page to see the latest updates. And uh, given we just have a few minutes left, I'm I'm just gonna maybe turn it back to you to, I know you've been making some notes, so please go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, uh, and this is a campaign. Um, there's lots of opportunity to engage. Um, the federal government has not made a decision on its radioactive waste policy so far and this issue about specifically calling for a ban on reprocessing nuclear waste is something that the decision makers, i.e. parliamentarians, really need to hear about um, from you. Um, please do speak up about it. And the hope is that by having a webinar like the one we've had tonight, and I'll talk about another one in a couple of moments, that it helps um, you to uh, be more comfortable mm -hmm. Uh, speaking up and bringing these issues to the attention of your elected representatives and and to the relevant decision makers, including the um, Minister of Natural Resources, Minister Wilkinson. But this evening, um, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, Ramana uh, went through some of the, the history that um, originally resulted in the reprocessing of fuel waste and it talked about a number of various motivations, which initially were military and um, then were uh, to fuel unexpected massive growth in nuclear and more recently have been based on an argument about management of nuclear waste and uh, showed that um, all of those arguments have, have fizzled, if I can put it that way. And renewable is uh, overtaking uh, is, is rapidly, um, well, actually, yes, overtaking uh, nuclear if we look at the most recent year globally. Um, and uh, both in the original presentation and in the questions, Ramana talked about some of the problems of reprocessing and the types of uh, issues and dangers that arise uh, in the handling, in the generation of more nuclear waste, very difficult to deal with nuclear waste, and the um, issues related to safeguards um, and the fact, uh, as he outlined um, in answer to that other question, uh, any plutonium is usable by uh, uh, you know, 
nefarious <laughs> uh, users or um, rogue states um, or by uh, governments that are um, just changing their mind about the intention of the program that they have been um, pursuing to this date. Uh, and then Ray talked to us about the work that she's been involved in a big global campaign uh, seeking uh, an international treaty to ban nuclear weapons about the fact that Canada has declined to uh, support that treaty um, and uh, that the uh, stance of Canada in this respect is inconsistent with some of the other stances that um, uh, we espouse and that the current government espouses uh, like uh, support for feminism, uh, like uh, uh, being perceived as progressive on the global stage um, and uh, uh, supporting, um, you know, a more secure and peaceful world. Um, not supporting that treat treaty is contrary to those aims. And uh, I took quite a lesson, I think, from Ray pointing out that um, the connections between those uh, ways of looking at the world need to be illuminated and discussed. Um, and, uh, and so I think there's a lot for, for uh, us to think about there. And I'm looking forward to looking at the resources that Ray was um, putting in the chat. And, and uh, I believe Brene will be circulating to the attendees, um, those as well with the PowerPoints. And then uh, Joshua uh, recently wrote the book, uh, Atomic Days which is a um, history lesson in one particular uh, location in the US uh, where there is extensive um, contamination uh, because of work on reprocessing for the purpose of weapons. And the fact that even to this day, decades later, uh, government industry and the, the regulators and the overseers don't have the technical answers to actually clean up this problem. And it's already caused enormous harm and has uh, the potential and the likelihood to continue causing um, a great deal of additional uh, harm, the like of which is not uh, evident anywhere else in the Western hemisphere, uh, along with some uh, massive catastrophic risks that are not well understood by the public or others and, and don't have management uh, plans to avoid according to um, whistleblowers. And um, again, uh, uh, I would echo the person in the, in the chat who pointed out that uh, when people are wondering why we should pay attention to these kinds of issues, uh, it's twofold. One is that sometimes we um, get ourselves, we meaning society at large, get ourselves into fixes we didn't anticipate. Um, we didn't realize how big a problem it would be. And uh, secondly, um, we need to know our history uh, and learn from our history and then try to make the best decisions we can make going forward. And, you know, when I'm speaking to um, students, university students and so on, I'm often asked about uh, uh, the dynamic and the tug of war in terms of choosing different technologies and different options and how there are is harm and consequences from practically anything we do. And I often say it's true when we're talking energy, for example, or when we're talking waste management, um, there are a whole bunch of terrible answers and some are just a lot more terrible than others. And so we have to try to choose um, the best way forward that we can collectively um, concur uh, and not continue the historic the terrible historic contamination, the ongoing current um, uh, risk um, uh, that's being established or the uh, potential for making things even worse. Um, so terrific thanks to all of you. And uh, Renine has and Susan have repeatedly assured people there will be a recording from the um, webinar this evening. And, uh, and the PowerPoints and, uh, and resources will be shared. Um, in addition, uh, I would like to say thank you to our um, co-sponsors, um, 
Beyond Nuclear, Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, my organization, CELA, the Coalition for Responsible Energy Development, New Brunswick, the Conservation Council of New Brunswick, Interchurch Uranium, Committee Educational Cooperative, the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War Canada, Northwatch, uh, Regroupement des Organismes Environnementaux en Energy, Sierra Club of Canada Foundation, and Voice of Women for Peace. And I'd also like to let you know that um, we have a webinar planned for uh, February 28th, uh, 7 p.m. It's a Tuesday, setting it up as a book club discussion with the authors of the book Plutonium, How Nuclear Power's Dream Fuel Became a Nightmare, um, with uh, uh, Frank uh, Von Hippel, Youngman Kang, and Masafumi uh, Taku. Uh, to Kubo. Um, and uh, Ramana will be our moderator that evening. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to all of you for attending and to so many of you for hanging in for a, a long technical presentation that matters enormously. Thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Take care and good night, everyone.